Well, here we are in the middle of winter, plenty of snow still on the ground. I hope you're warm and toasty in a time that is really very troubling. We, we live in troubling times. You know, for about the last, a little bit less than 240 years or so, we here in North America have been living in societies that have been really founded and, and run on the basis of constitutions and charter of rights and freedoms. And we've had this separation of church and state. But you know, for the most of history, for most of the history of mankind, there hasn't been this separation of church and state. Usually there was a, a church or a, a religion that was a state religion, and everybody had to worship the official god of that state, whatever it might have been. And they didn't look at it the way they did. People didn't have individual rights. That was not considered, you know, that wasn't even part of the idea that they had individual rights. They had the right to do as they were told. This is essentially what it was. And the state owned you. They owned your body. In one way or another, you, you were accountable for them. We have, however, in North America, you know, the Americans had their Declaration of Independence. They had their had to fight a war to attain uh, sovereignty so that they could decide for themselves how they wanted to live. And then they, to do this, they came up with a constitution and a bill of rights. And here in Canada, eventually, we were heavily influenced by the Americans, even coming up with our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and we have our own constitution. The British people had their unwritten constitutional rights of what it meant to be an Englishman. But all these things, as we can see, are starting to fade in our society. They're starting, we can see that no longer are really our ruling elites are taking these things seriously because they, 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 you know, they're no longer, they, they want to go someplace else, it would appear. We as Christians are living in a changing time. It is a crossroads. It is a crossroads. We have to consider some lessons from what the scriptures have to say in living in a society. Because we are wayfarers. We are pilgrims. This is not our, you know, our citizenship it is a heavenly one. You know, here in this world, we may have citizenships, and maybe you're an American citizen, maybe you're a Canadian citizen, whatever citizen of country you are in, you have certain res uh, responsibilities and maybe even a few rights, <laughs> depending upon what those, you know, with this current state of affairs. But how do we live and how do we do things and how do we square and, you know, we, we need to look in the pages of the Bible to give us some understanding of how we are to behave because things are changing and we have to be aware of this. What does God expect of you and what does he expect of me? For the Apostle Paul, the gospel he preached was the fulfillment of the message prophesied by uh, the prophet Isaiah. Let's go to chapter 40 in Isaiah. Chapter 40 in Isaiah. Chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. <laughs> and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. See, there is a coming time when God will start to remake the world. He, he will refresh it in, in a remarkable way. He will renew it in remarkable ways. The times of refreshing that are coming. This is a great part of the gospel that, that Paul thought about in his preaching. Verse 6, Isaiah 40, verse 6. A voice said, shout. And I asked, what should I shout? 
Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord, and so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. See, all the governments of this world, you know, they tend to think of themselves as being permanent and here forever and ever and whatever. This is the, and, and human beings themselves. We are, that is not the reality. We, we are temporary. And all these leaders we have, they're here for, and then they're gone. But it's the word of God that stands forever. Not the word of some parliament or some dictator or some whoever he is, dear leader of some sort. It's the word of God that stands forever. Verse 9. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the housetops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. You know, he's say to the, to the people of God, because the towns of Judah, the people who know, but for so often, you know, Judah had been subject to conquest by various foreign rulers. We'll get into that. You Shout to the, you know, do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Verse 10, yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. That's what Isaiah prophesied. To say to a people who desperately wanted to hear that message, needed to hear that message to be encouraged. What does it mean to be a sovereign? <laughs> Most of us don't know because we don't think about this, but the quality, you know, the, the dictionary says the quality or state of being sovereign or of having supreme power or authority. Supreme power and authority. Yes, the sovereign Lord of the Bible is coming. Supreme power. Supreme and independent power or authority in government as possessed and claimed by a state or a community. Let's go back to Isaiah 40 in the latter part of verse 10. And he will rule. Yes, a sovereign Lord is, is coming in power and he will rule with a powerful arm. He brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms. He will hold them close to his heart. He will lead them gently, the mother sheep with the young. See, this gives you an attitude. Here he is, the supreme, you know, the supreme Lord who has all power. <laughs> In heaven and earth is who's coming. And what is his attitude? His attitude towards his people is not, you know, to tell them like the president of France to piss off, you know, or something like this. No, it's, he wants the, he, he loves his people. He cares about his people. He's not like, you know, various prime ministers talking about their deplorables or those that they can't stand who are miserable, whatever it is, racist and misogynist and all these other things. That's not the attitude of the sovereign Lord. Verse 12, Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who else has held the oceans in his hands? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? See, compare all the rulers of this present world. Who are these people in comparison to the God of the Bible? This is what the Lord is saying. You know, they're nothing. You know, they're just like grass. Who is able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Verse 14, has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Does someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? Well, in antiquity, during the time of Paul and all the apostles in Jesus Christ, it certainly wasn't Caesar Nero or the Roman Senate, was it? You know, when Paul went to Rome to preach the gospel message about Jesus, the Lord, the Kyrios of the world... The sovereign Lord here, that he well knew of Isaiah 40. He was indeed claiming through the gospel of the coming kingdom of God. 
He was proclaiming it. The gospel of the coming kingdom of God and the true Lord of the earth. And with it, the coming of God's righteousness. Which when we say righteousness, you know, this is a spiritual speak. It's also to say God's justice. Since the Greek word used by Paul has both meanings. Let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, verse 17. I'm going to read 16 to 17. Now I'm going to cite this in the Amplified Bible version. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul says this. Now, here's a little exhortation, and that's good. This is good for us, all each of us to hear in a time when most people have turned their backs on the God of the Bible. Certainly, our leaders have. Romans 1, 16, Paul says here, to the brethren who dwelt in Rome, okay, where it was very politically correct to be a fan of the Roman government, by the way. You could well imagine with Nero in charge. <laughs> Anyways, Roman 1, 16, Paul says, I give this guy credit. He really had nerve. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Believes what? Believes that Christ is the prophesied Messiah of the scriptures, who is coming as the Savior of the people of God. See, it's not... It's not Caesar Nero who like to, you know, they call themselves sort of savior. You know, this is one of the things that the Caesars like to do. So it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Because in God's economy, in his, in his family, there is everyone. The racial differences, ethnic differences, has, has, you know, has no meaning. It's, it's, it's the faith that people have, where the God is pleased with them. Romans 1, 17. For the gospel of righteousness, dikaiot one, Okay, righteousness, it's a Greek word. Of God, the gospel of righteousness is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith. And it is amplified, though it's disclosed in a way that awakens more faith. God discloses himself in a way that we can have more faith in him. In him, the one who created the heavens and the earth who is there and has been with the people of God from generation to generation through all the things the people of God have gone through. As it is written and forever remains written, the just will live by faith. For the gospel of righteousness, or the gospel of Greek is the way Paul put it, dikaiosone, dikaiosone means we typically, and many people, righteousness, okay, that's that's church speak, religious speak. But it also means very clearly the word, and it was used in the society of the time to mean justness. Uh, justice, justness, righteousness, righteousness of which God is the source or author. It means, uh, uh, the approval of God refers to what is deemed right by the Lord after his examination, what is approved in his eyes. The gospel, as I said again, the gospel, the righteousness of God. The gospel that Paul was preaching to the Romans included the message, you know, I'm sure, because it's, it's, it's right here about how God's righteousness or justice was unveiled once and for all time, and it would throw, flow from God throughout the entire world. Such a gospel that Paul was preaching would certainly have been seen as a direct challenge to Caesar in the Roman state of his contemporary times. How so? You know, you know what am I talking about? Why? Why was what gospel, the gospel that God was, uh, that Paul was preaching? God was pre preaching through Paul, the gospel, <laughs> the righteousness of righteousness. You know, because the Romans, it's very interesting why this, they, at the time, it would have been seen as a challenge. 
The Romans had a uh, had the uh, a goddess called Eustitia, which, as well as the Caesar cult, was at that point in time comparatively new in the Apostle Paul's world. The temple to Eustitia in Rome had only been established. And it was it, just as a coincidence while I was preparing that. I, when was the temple of Eustitia? When was it established? It was established. Today's the anniversary, July, January 8th, you know, but at 13 AD, some 2009 years ago. This temple to this goddess Eustitia is, if we were translated into modern English, would be the, the goddess of Lady Justice. The Romans saw Lustitia as an allegorical personification of the moral force of their justice systems. And they represented her. Her visual attributes were a blindfold, scales, <laughs> and a sword. Rome prided itself on being the capital of justice from which justice would flow through its empire. So without losing any of his deep-seated Jewish meanings of covenant faithfulness of the Creator God, with that <laughs> is the means of, you know, of the fact that God's righteousness, the gospel of God's righteousness is God's dealing with sins and the justification of those who believe. Paul, when he declared in his gospel of, of God's righteousness that he was good preaching, is a declaration that the gospel of King Jesus reveals God's true righteousness. And it would be seen by his contemporaries in preaching this as a deliberate challenge to the Rome's imperial pretensions about being the ultimate source of justice to the entire known world of the time, or at least the entire of their, emperor, their empire. The gospel that Paul was preaching was asserting that real true justice, real true justice could only not be found in Rome's gospel, which announced Caesar as Lord, to whom you would offer worship, but rather through the gospel of Jesus, who is both sovereign Lord and Messiah, fulfilling the pro prophecies of the Bible. And all the prophecies of bringing in the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Let's go to Acts 2.36. Right at the beginning, the apostles, after the church was founded, the apostles, what did they do? They understood the role, uh, this prime point in the gospel. Therefore, as it says in Acts 2.36, let all the house of Israel recognize beyond all doubt that God has made Jesus, made him both Lord and Christ. You know, both the one Lord, you know, is the Kyrios, the one who has the ultimate sovereign authority in the state, and Christ, the, the, uh, the, the Messiah. He's fulfilling the role in Scripture, this Jesus whom you crucified. Because this is what you know they were understanding. It was fulfillment of this great expectation. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40 and pick this up again. Isaiah 40, verse 15. No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. You know, I remember, you know, even <laughs> many years ago when I saw this, um, uh, this movie about uh, the runner during one of the, one of the Olympics, and they wanted him, they were trying to force him to run on what he thought was the Sabbath, you know, from this standpoint. But it wasn't the Sabbath. It was a, it was a, you know, it was a Sunday Sabbath, but he was a religious person of that time, a Scottish fellow. And he would cite this. They were going to, you know, they were going to strip him of his honor to, to run and to compete and do all these things at this point in his life. But he, you know, recognized and, you know, in spite of all of this, he, he saw that the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than the dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. 
all the wood of Lebanon's forests, and all Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes they count for less than nothing, mere emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? I'm going to have Lusticia, the Romans, you know, or maybe a a statue of Caesar. Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words that he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant that God sits above the circle of the earth, the people below seem like grasshoppers to him? He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. Maybe the Chinese should be thinking about a little more about this and their pride and the arrogance there in Beijing and Z, Chairman Z. They hardly get started, barely take root when he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? asks the Holy One. Look up into the heaven. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O Jacob, people of God, chosen ones for a purpose, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can (laughs) measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is a remarkable message for this time, for this winter. You know, the the authors of the New Covenant Scriptures, the Gospels, the Epistles, men like the Apostles Paul and John and Peter and James, they were all, of course, they were Jews. (laughs) In the first century A.D., the Jews who lived in a world, you know, at that time, they they lived in a world that was immersed, that was embedded in the Greco-Roman culture, which by then had long dominated the whole region of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East, and North Africa. The whole region had been transformed over a span of just 13 years from 336 to 323 B.C. by the wars of Alexander the Great, who who destroyed the great Archimedes Persian Empire, Medeo Persian Empire, that previously governed the whole area. And this had been prophesied by the prophet Daniel. You could go to Daniel 8 and uh, verses 5 to 8, and you can see this whole thing. God had allowed it. You have in Daniel the succession of these world-ruling kingdoms, and they each would be there for a season, and then they would disappear. They would depart. But God is there forever. And if you read through Daniel, you see eventually the kingdom is given to his people and is a kingdom that will never be destroyed, that will never disappear. There is great hope that God gives his people. But he shows that there are all these, in the meantime, these, these kingdoms that he oftentimes compares to wild beasts you know, ruling the earth. 
Now, as a result of the prophecy in Daniel about the destruction of the Persian Empire and the succession of the, you know, the, what became the Hellenized uh, empires, of the, the generals of Alexander the Great, who succeeded him because Alexander didn't live very long after he completed his conquest, which was prophesied in the scripture. But as a result, a new cultural status arose and led to the widespread adoption of Greek Hellenistic culture. At that time, you know, Greek functioned much like that in the way of English as it now functions in our, in our modern civilization, communicating ideals of justice uh, spreading around the world, politics, social organization, and, you know, morality or the lack thereof. <laughs> and mostly it's the lack thereof these days. Uh, during that time, eventually the Romans, starting in the first century, they really, in their ruthless lust for power, supplanted all the various Hellenistic Greek dynasty families, one by one, Seleucids, Ptolemies, you know, the, the, the group that was in Greece, they, they, they knocked them off, essentially, <laughs> and they took over. It was a hustle. They came in, and they said, new management running the show. They essentially took over what they were doing and expanded upon it, but they didn't do away with it. This is the, all the, the Hellenistic rulers loved to be worshipped as, as gods and printed their coins and thought of as saviors to the people. The Romans did the same thing. The Romans were indeed ruthless when it came to the lust for power. But they were also quite pragmatic once it was clear that they were in charge. They showed themselves willing to make a deal with the locals if it served their ends. Anti Wright, in his book, Paul, A Biography, makes this point. He says, he points out that one deal in particular was struck with the Jews themselves by the Caesars and Rome. All the other ethnic groups of peoples of Paul's days and regions from Spain to Syria had to worship the goddess Roma and the Kyrios Caesar, that is, Lord Caesar, because he was absolute. Lord Caesar... Augustus Caesar, you know, the, you know, uh, Augustus, when he succeeded his father, uh, well, actually his adoptive father, Julius, um, he took for himself the title uh, Divi Filius, son of the deified one, or in Greek simply as Weos Theo, son of God. Oh, isn't that nice? You know, Augustus, you know, I'm... I'm a Weos um, Theos, son of God. His successor, Caesar's, mostly, you know, followed suit, and just followed, you know, what Augustus set up for them, and they demanded worship. Because the Romans realized, you know, their legions couldn't be everywhere. While, the, you know, while the military force was the pointy edge of their power, they realized the importance of soft power, what we call soft power these days. And they you know, they preached the, the, the gospel of Caesar, that he was providing prosperity, justice, peace, the Pax Romana, high level of civilization, great infrastructure, you know, all this sort of stuff that they preached. <laughs> the propaganda, the proved narrative of the cults of Rome, Roma and, and the emperor spread, you know, abroad, and you still see them in the museum, the various artistic statues of the Caesars, where every, they would place these in strategic places, and everybody could see Caesar, you know, and they would offer him the pinch of incense as, as worship. And all the other peoples of the, uh, under in the Roman Empire had to do this, with the sole exception being the Jews, because the Romans, you know, they realized that the, the Jews were a different case. <laughs> and they also used one of the things that's spreading the, their, their propaganda of the day, of that time in ancient antiquity, would be the empire's legal currency, its coinage, where in which they stamped Caesar's image to show his prosperity and greatness. It was all connected. If you wanted to get ahead in the world, it was with Caesar. And we find that it's an interesting thought when we, when we see what's here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 15. Matthew 22 and verse 15. And remember, Jesus is, you know, growing up, he was born... You know, there in uh, Judea and in, in Bethlehem, grew up in Galilee. All this area was under the 
rule and authority of Rome's client kings, or under direct Roman rule, and later in a little bit later when the governors took direct rule. But at that time, Rome in, in Matthew 22, verse 15, it said, Then the Pharisees left that place and made it plans, and they plotted to trap Jesus and saying something wrong in his words. They sent some of their own followers and some people from their group called the Herodians. The Herodians were, of course, a bunch of political collaborationists with the Roman power who supported, you know, Roman, Roman ends. And they said, teacher, we know that you are an honest man. Okay, they're buttering him up. And that you teach the truth, you know, with sincerity and honesty about God's way. And you're not afraid of what other people think about you because you pay no attention to, you know, to, who, you know, you don't play any uh, favorites. You aren't partial. You aren't swayed by your, you know, appearances. You tell it like it is, verse 17. So tell us what you think. Okay, they buttered them up. Now they're going to, you know, they're going to try to set their trap. What do you think? Is it permissible? Is it right? Is it lawful for us who are Jews to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because a lot of the people of God, a lot of the Jews said, you know, what are we doing here? You know, these are idolaters and all these evil people. <laughs> you know, what are, what are we doing at all to support these people? Jesus said, you know, yes, it was permissible to pay the taxes. He would anger the Jews who hated the Roman rule. So he'd, he'd alienate some of his base. But saying no, you know, you know there, there were the Herodians were standing right there. They could charge him. We're setting an insurrection. That would have been, uh, you know, a charge that would have been uh, more deadly than the charges that the Democrats are laying against people charged with insurrection here at, at, uh, la a year ago. Verse 18, but knowing, but knowing what they were trying to, uh, that they were trying to trick him, he, he, Jesus knew they had uh, malicious motives. Jesus <clears throat> said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me a coin used to pay the tax. So then showed him a coin. They brought him a denar denarius, you know, which would have represented a day's wage. Silver coin, nice silver coin. And Jesus asked, whose image, you know, whose likeness, whose portrait and name? The inscription is on this coin. And the men answered, Caesar's, probably Caesar Tiberius. You know, which was interesting because, uh, you know, these people who were representing themselves to be religious were carrying around Caesar's money in their pocket. Then Jesus said to them, you know, his famous answer, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. It was a highly tuned diplomatic answer. <laughs> It's a highly tuned diplomatic answer. He didn't give them the answer they were looking for. He sort of slipped between out of their trap of what they were trying to lay for him. Give to God what is God. And, you know, Caesar's here. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. This is his money. The Romans wanted all their subject peoples to worship Caesar. But as I said, being pragmatists, they realized they had to make an accommodation with the Jews. Because the Jews, you know, the Romans, you know, they're one of their, one of their, uh, <laughs> one of the ways that they, uh, I, I guess, a, a put downs instead of calling them deplorables or something like this, the Romans called the Jews oftentimes porcupines. <laughs> Because they realized that the, 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 the porcupine could, you know, just like the porcupine, the Jews could inflict painful barbs to those people who would try to predate on them. The Romans realized that Jews would worship and pay, pray to only one God, the God of their ancestors, whom they believed was the only true Kyrios, the only Lord worthy of praise. 
You know, of course, you know, that's what the Shema is all about. Deuteronomy 6 4, as the NRSV puts it, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Yahweh Echad in, in Hebrew. Expanded translates it Listen, people of Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. See, that's the point. That is the point. So what was to be done? Did the Romans try to force the Jews to comply with their, you know, worship Caesar mandate? Like some of the earlier conquering empires, or, you know, the Seleucids under Antiochus Epiphanes that we, we talked about during the time of Hanukkah. Or how about Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon when he, corrected, when he erected his great golden statue and said, you fall down and worship my statue when you hear the sound of all the music. Or you get thrown in the burning fiery furnace. The Romans knew that they could, you know, make a pretty good <laughs> game out of forcing the porcupine, the Jews, to do what they want them to do. But at what cost? <laughs> at what cost? You know, <laughs> they decided that, uh, uh, okay, uh, it's when, when some Jewish leaders you know, went to Rome and they proposed instead of praying to Caesar that they pray to their one God, for Caesar and for Rome and its emperor, would that be enough? And Caesar was ready to make a deal, and he said, well, yes, that will do. The Romans granted the Jews a special pragmatic privilege to live and let live. But even though they did that, there would be forever tension between the Jews and their Roman overlords. It would always be a source of you know, it, it wasn't. In, you know, it it was a it was a fix. It worked often, but not always. <laughs> and that would be the story of history of all the succeeding times. There was this tension, and when the Church of God came along, initially, of course, all the members and the leaders they were Jews, but. You know the story of Paul and Barnabas's ministry, and what began to happen is that other people from other nations, the Gentiles of the other nations, the Greeks and whatever living in the Eastern Mediterranean, began to be interested in a message of salvation, a message of where true righteousness and justice would come from. Well, I was going to present some problems to the church because these other people weren't Jews and the empire had you know they had they had their mandates for Caesar worship you had to you had to worship at the statue of Caesar let's go to Acts 16 verse 16 we'll read this in Philip's one day this is, of course, Luke writing about he and Paul and the other guys who were with him in the, in the ministry team. One day, while we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a young girl who had a spirit of clairvoyance and brought her owner, owners a good deal of profit by foretelling the future. So she was like Madame X. <laughs> You know, and she was good because she actually had, you know, a, a, one of the, a, a demon who, was, who would bring stuff up. And she would follow Paul and the rest of us crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they are telling you the way of salvation. She continued this behavior for many days. <laughs> and then Paul, in a burst of irritation, turned around and spoke to the spirit in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out immediately, but when the girl's owners saw that their hope of making money out of her had disappeared, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the market square, the place of justice where the magistrate would sit on his throne and administer justice. And they brought him before the chief magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are causing a great disturbance in our city. They are proclaiming customs which it is illegal for us as Roman cities, citizens to accept or practice. Because he's preaching the gospel about who is the true Lord, the Lord Jesus. 
And of course, that would mean that they would not offer worship to Caesar. At this, the crowd joined the attack, and the magistrates <laughs> had them stripped and ordered them to be beaten with rods. Then after giving them a severe beating, they threw them into prison and instructed the jailer to keep them safe. And receiving such strict orders, he hustled them into the inner jail and fastened their feet securely in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God while the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, big enough to shake the foundations of the prison. Immediately, all the doors flew open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the doors of the prison had been opened, he drew his sword and was at the point of killing himself because, of course, it was his life for all of their custody. The authorities would say, you know, this is how they handled the jail guards in those days. Something happened to your prisoners, you pay with your skin. <laughs> it's not like today, you know, where people can be uh, commit suicide in prison and, and nothing happens to the jailers. The Romans <laughs> were, not, <laughs> were not so naive. They said, something happened to these guys, it's your neck on the line, buddy. So they, they, they were serious about their job. So he, he saw all the doors had been, and the jail had been opened. He drew his sword and was at the point of killing himself, for he had imagined all the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out to him at the top of his voice, Don't hurt yourself. We are all here. Then the jailer called for lights, rushed in, trembling all over, fell at the feet of, feet of Paul and Silas. And he led them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, Caesar couldn't save him. And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your all your household. Then they told him and all the members of his household the message of God. They preached to him the gospel. In the early hours of the morning. <laughs> there and then in the middle of the night, he took them aside and washed their wounds. That is the jailer. And he himself and all his family were baptized without delay. Then he took them into his house and offered them food. And he and his whole family overjoyed at finding faith in God. Verse 35. When the morning came, the magistrates sent their constables with the message, let those men go. You know, Paul and Silas, you know, kick them out of town. The jailer reported this message to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to have you released, so now you can leave this place and go on your way in peace. But Paul said to the constables, They beat us publicly without any kind of trial. They threw us into prison despite the fact that we are Roman citizens, and now do they want to get rid of us in this underhanded way? Oh no, let them come and take us out themselves. <laughs> See, Paul was using his Roman citizenship, said we have certain rights under the Rome, and the Roman government of that time actually respected the rights of their citizens. <laughs> and the magistrates and the jailers and the constable all knew this. And they knew the Romans did actually uh, respect their law and enforce it, unlike our current authorities, which do not respect the laws and rights of their citizens. The constables reported this to the magistrates who were thoroughly alarmed when they heard that they were Romans. So they came in person and apologized to them and after taking them out of the prison, requested them to leave the city <laughs> before they get into big trouble. But on leaving the prison, Paul and Silas went to Lydia's house, one of the believers' house that they had converted in the town. And when they had seen the brothers and given them fresh courage, they took their leave. Paul had to learn how to operate in this society, and it was difficult. And the brethren who were coming in, it wasn't lawful for them to participate in what was essentially worshiping a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish Lord because the Romans were insisting everybody worship the whatever. <laughs> you know, Lord Caesar, offer your pinch of, of incense. Let's go to 1 Peter 2 and verse 10. This was a considerable issue for the church. 
and how they had to finesse it. 1 Peter 2 and verse 10 amplified Peter's audience, you know, writing his general epistle to all the brethren at the time. Once you were not a people, because you're all these different ethnic groups. You're not just Jews. You're all these different groups who've come into the truth. But you're all living under the domination of the Roman Empire. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. From the church's perspective, they were God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Brethren, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in this world, and we are, we are pilgrims, we are aliens and strangers in this world. This is not the country we hope for. We are looking for a city whose foundations are going to be laid by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the world tomorrow, which will be coming, which is promised, which we will have a role in and a share in. And it will, we will be there and forever and ever as God's <coughs> true children. We won't be like the grass, this current society, this, you know, this time, this, this life in the flesh, which goes by all so quickly. Yes, I, beloved, verse 11, 1 Peter 2, 11, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from sensual urges that war against the soul. So we have to be careful against all the desires, you know, the dishonorable desires that want us to get off the way the scripture tells us how we are to behave. We have to do things God's way. What he says is the way we should behave according to the scriptures. Because they're trying, these things are trying to defeat us. And he says, verse 12, Keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved Gentiles. People you're living with, your neighbors who know you. You know, in that time, you didn't have any privacy. You know, people lived in, you know, relatively small spaces in crowded cities, you know, surrounded by walls or whatever. And people, <laughs> they didn't have the sort of privacy that we even have now still at this point in time, we may not have any digital privacy or whatever. And government may be watching us every place we go and monitoring and surveilling us and all this other stuff. Some places it's worth. Brethren in Hong Kong, you have it really bad. Keep your behavior excellence among the unsaved Gentiles. Let's conduct yourself honest, honest, honorably with graciousness and integrity so that for whatever reason they may slander you as evildoers, you're unvaxxed, whatever it might be, yet by observing your good deeds, they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation. When hopefully he will look upon them with mercy, the average people. Leaders will be a different story because they obviously, you know, they know more and they're going to be held to account. And then Paul says this. Peter. Peter, excuse me. Peter says this. Well, Peter, Paul. <laughs> Peter says this. Submit yourself to the authority of every human institution for the sake of the Lord. That is to honor our Lord's name. See, we, we, we do this and we do things, we use, we work through the system in the way God would have us do, just like Paul did. You know, they beat him and said, oh, well, okay, yes, but we don't want, you know, the next time we come by this, this city, you know, we don't want to get the same treatment or one of uh, uh, um, other people in our ministry we might send. You know, we, we do that. Submit yourself to to the authority of human institution for the sake of the Lord, that is honoring the Lord's name, which means we have to do things his way, not do things necessarily the world's way. Whether it's the king as one in the position of power, and they say they weren't trying to, you know, launch an insurrection or be accused of one, or to governors as sent by him to bring punishment to those who do wrong and to praise those who encourage them to do right. So they, you know, all the early apostles, you know, we're, we, they weren't here to foster anarchy. 
or insurrection, you know, you know, stab the Romans and the whatever, you know, because there were plenty of Jews in that time, the zealots who were doing that, cutting the throats of the, you know, Roman soldiers, you know, in the, in the dark alleyways or whatever it might be, or their rivals or people they thought were compromising with the Romans or informers. All this was going on at the time. Verse 15, for it is the will of God that by doing right you may silence, muzzle, gag the culpable ignorance and irresponsible criticisms of foolish people. And there are many foolish people. I read letters to the editor and so can you. And then what they say is just outrageous at times. Live as free people. We are to live as God's free people. He said, do not use your freedom as a cover or pretext for evil. But use it or live it as bond servants of God. We are God's servants. We're God's ambassadors. We have to do things God in the way he would have us do. Show respect for all people. Treat them honorably. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king which is not always an easy thing to do. But then I could imagine, you know, <laughs> it's interesting that, that Peter would write this, you know, or, you know, and, and Paul would have echoed it. You know, at the time when Nero was Caesar, that was, that was you know, you, you have to look, you know, for is there a blessing for Caesar? Yes, may, may God keep Caesar far away from us, you know. But they weren't out there trying to foment an insurrection. He goes further in verse 18, servants be submissible to your masters with all proper respect, not only to those who are good and kind, but those who are unreasonable. This is slaves he's talking about because that was many of the people who came in the church, they were slaves. And why did they come in the church? Because the church offered them hope. It offered them a future. The gospel predicted, as we read there in Isaiah 40, for this finds favor if a person endures the sorrow of suffering unjustly because of an awareness of the will of God. After all, what kind of credit is it? Is there if you, when you do wrong, you're punished for it and you endure it patiently? But if when you do what is right and patiently bear undeserved suffering, this finds favor with God. For as a believer, you've been called for this purpose, since Christ suffered for you, leaving an example so that you may follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit ever found in his mouth. You know, I could go into John 18 and, you know, in that whole part in 19. Jesus is brought up before Pilate. You know, and, and Jesus was making the, the point that, you know, Pilate, you, you, you have no power except that it's been granted to you for the moment because there is a purpose God wanted to fulfill. Jesus needed to be sacrificed, and it was in a particular way that the Romans did to pay the penalty for the sins of humanity. But, of course, it's woe to those who do such things. Woe to those who do such things. You know, Peter and, and Paul and all the rest. You know, when we talk, let's go to let's go to um, Paul in Ephesians one, writing to the Ephesian brethren. He says, Ephesians 1, let's go to verse 18. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened and flooded with light by the Holy Spirit so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, everything that's promised in the scriptures of what God is saying that he will give to his people, you know, that whole section there in Daniel 9. And so, that you will begin to know what the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness, greatness of his active spiritual power is in us who believe. 
These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion on this earth. Doesn't matter, you know, whether it's angelic or human. It's far above. Christ is sovereign, and far above every name that is named, above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and world, but also in the one to come. That's the one whom we acknowledge as our Lord and Savior. And He put all things in every realm in subjection under Christ's feet and appointed him as supreme and authoritative head over all things in the church. Jesus Christ is the one whom we worship. He's the one whom we will obey above all things. There are times when we come into conflict with this world's authorities. What are we to do? Acts, let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 17. Acts chapter 1 and verse 17. This is just shortly after the church was first founded. And the apostles were preaching in the temple, but once they came in to preach and they were arrested because the rulers of the temple, a religious establishment, didn't want to hear what they had to say. It was not according to the approved narrative. The high priest stood up along with his associates, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy and resentment. And they arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and leading them out and said, Go, stand, and continue to tell the people in the, in the temple courtyards the whole message of this life. And when they heard this, they went into the temple courtyards about daybreak and began teaching. Now when the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together you know, the, the high court, the Sanhedrin, even all the council of elders and, <clears throat> and sent word to the pr uh, prison for the apostles to be brought before them. But when the officers <laughs> arrived, they did not find them in the prison. See, they'd locked the doors. The doors were all locked. There weren't any windows. This was just a hole, right? They, you put them in this hole, you lock the door, and where are they going? <laughs> and they came back and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened the doors, we found no one inside. <laughs> they didn't say what they did to the guards. I'm sure this was not pleasant for them afterwards. Now, when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these things, they were greatly perplexed, wondering what would come of this. Okay, there'd be rumor mongering that would be go on. They were aware of the grapevine, the social media of the day. And when someone came and told them, the men whom you put in prison are standing right here in the temple teaching the people, then the captain went with the officers and brought them back without hurting them. <laughs> they didn't beat on them because they were afraid of the people and worried that they, the, 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 the captain of the guards and his guards might be stoned that people were, would get so upset. So they brought them and presented them before the high court. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And you have filled, yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood on us by accusing them of being his murderers, which they were. <laughs> then Peter and the apostles replied, you, Well, you know what they said, don't you? We must obey God rather than men. See, this is our ultimate choice when we deal with authority, which is not very righteous. We are aliens and strangers at this time. We are, but we are here. We live in these societies, but we must obey God rather than men when it comes to questions of consciousness. Let's go to Philippians 3.20, Philippians 3.20. We'll close out this. Let me be your example here, Paul is saying to the brethren there in Philippi. Not Jews, coming in the church. You know, Let my example be the standard by which you tell who are the genuine Christians among uh, those about you. 
For there are many of whom I have told you before and tell you now, even with tears, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. These men are heading for utter destruction. Their God is their own appetite and their pride in what they should be ashamed of. And the world is the limit of their horizon. But we are, where are we citizens? Are we citizens of the Roman Empire? Of which it's not lawful for you to be, you know, fellowshipping with us and worshiping Jesus as the sovereign Lord instead of Caesar. But we are citizens of heaven. Our outlook goes beyond this world to the hopeful expectation of the Savior who will come from heaven. It will be the restoration of all things, of what God has promised in the scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ, Kyrios, and he will remake these wretched bodies of ours to resemble his own glorious body by that power of his which makes him the master of everything that is. Brethren, we have to keep our perspective straight in a society such as we are living in right now, which is at a crossroads, which is becoming less friendly to the people of God at this point in time. It's starting to resemble more and more the world of Jesus Christ and the apostles. Let's remember their teachings that we must obey God rather than men when it comes to doing what is right. Jesus Christ, yes, he is our example. He is the sovereign Lord. Till next week.